grit and grace. At the Democratic National Convention in America, where they're working out who's going to be the... Well, I mean, they're not working it out, it's going to be Hillary. But where they're supposedly working out who's going to be the Democratic nominee for president in the, in the States to go up against Donald Trump. They, uh, Meryl Streep... I'm going to preach from the Bible, but I'm coming to Meryl Streep first. Um, Meryl Streep uh, gave a little speech, and she said this. What does it take? for someone to be the first female anything. Talking about Hillary Clinton. What does it take for a woman to be the first female anything? Then she answers her own question and says, it takes grit and it takes grace. Grace and grit. Grit and grace. Those are are some things, when I heard that, it started whirring around in my mind. And I was was thinking, I mean, she's talking about a woman becoming president. She's talking about a woman overcoming in a society that that by and large hasn't had many women doing lots of these sort of big, important jobs over over the years. Historically, uh, that's the culture that America has been, and to some degree still is. This isn't a message about gender or or men or women. This is a a message about overcoming. (coughs) This is a, a, a morning where we're thinking about what are the ingredients it takes to live a life overcoming the trials and the difficulties and the people who say, no, we can't do that, or the people who are trying to stop us walking in the victory that Jesus has achieved for us. This is, a, this is us examining what, it, what are the ingredients of an overcoming life. And as we look at some of the things going on in the world, there is much to overcome. There are many things which are very awful. There are many things which are difficult, which are disgusting, which are horrid going on in our world. We think of Japan, where a man murdered 19 uh, severely disabled people. Out of his, his belief and his desire and his, his vision for a Japan that was full only of able-bodied people. And so he took that into his own hands. It's horrible. It, it challenges and it, and it attacks the very, the very idea of life being important. It's something that, that we find abhorrent, something that we find disgusting. We think of France, where two men went into a church and took people hostage and murdered a priest. A part of an an escalating uh, attack, it seems, on not just a way of life, but very specifically on the church, on Christians, on faith. That's that's what was going on there. That was was not just attacking, attacking an idea or an idea. It's attacking us and our family and our brother. That priest who died and who is now in glory was part of our family. So it wasn't just an attack on him or on that church. It was an attack on us all. There is much to overcome in our world for all people. But for us as Christians, there are specific things where we are under attack. Of course, there's, there's our own lives as well. Because we've, we've decided to drop out our normal sermon series for the time being in order to think about some of the things going on in our world week by week. But one of the dangers of that is that we start to think we should only be interested in big current affairs, big world issues, and little old me doesn't matter anymore. I really just need to get on and deal with it. That's not what I want this to be at all. We all have issues we're facing in our life. We all have deep joys and great things that are happening, but we also have challenges. We also have hardships. We also have people on our backs. Often we can feel under the cosh. And as I look around at the world, as I look around at all the things that are going on, I feel a little bit like that there's some verses that we're going to look at later where Paul says that he is perplexed but not in despair. I'm perplexed. I'm confused. I don't understand a lot of the things that are happening. I don't understand why these things are allowed to happen in our world, and yet they are. But how can we be in that place of being perplexed but not in desperation? How can we be overcomers? How can we have that victory? How can we be conquerors. We sung that song earlier. It's, it's based on some verses in, in Paul's writing in Romans chapter 8 where he says that we are more than conquerors through Christ. That Christ's victory reigns and lives in us. How can we take hold of that? What are the ingredients that we need for a life that overcomes the things that are going on in the world and the things that come against us? Well, I think Meryl Streep is onto something when she talks about an overcoming life being marked by grit and being marked by grace. It actually led me to a book. It's not a massive leap because the book is called Paul, A Man of Grace and Grit. 
Um, it's by uh, a guy called Charles Swindle, and he's written a bunch of sort of biographies of people in the Bible and their lives. They are a fantastic series. This is the one on, uh, on Paul. It's called Paul, a Man of Grace and Grit. I want to read a brief section from the introduction, because I think it sets us on the right foot for where we're going to be heading this morning. Charles Swindle writes, My well-worn dictionary defines grit as firmness of mind or spirit, unyielding courage in the face of hardship or danger. I love that. There's no better description of this man from Tarsus, that's Paul, whom God used to play such a major role in turning the world upside down for Christ in his generation. Tough, tenacious, and fierce, fierce, fiercely relentless in his determination, Paul pursued his divine mission with unflinching Resolve. The man modelled grit like no other soul mentioned in the sacred scriptures. But his message and his style, as we shall see, were also marked by grace. This one who himself claimed to be the least of all saints and the chief of all sinners understood and explained grace better than any of his contemporaries. It isn't difficult to understand why. He never got over his own gratitude as a recipient of it. God's unmerited favour, his superabounding grace reaching down to him in all his self-righteous zeal, crushed his pride, drove him to his knees, softened his heart and transformed this once violent aggressor into a powerful spokesman for Christ. A man with that much grit needed that much grace. Not surprisingly, grace dominated Paul's message and ministry to the final moment of his life. Hopefully, some of both will begin to seep into our lives as we cling closely to Paul's side. An enormous supply of each is desperately needed as we face the uncertain challenges of the future. And I would say that an enormous amount of both grace and grit, resolve, determination is needed for us to face our world, to face our life, to be overcomers in this world. So I want to look at some words from Paul. I want to look at some, some, some things as in his relationship with one of the churches he wrote to from 2 Corinthians. And this is the way that Paul describes himself and some of the things that have happened to him in this letter. It gives you a picture of where his mind is at, where his heart is at as he, as he writes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, we read this, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked. And besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I am not indignant. This is where Paul is at. Paul is struggling. He is tired. He's worn out. He's exhausted. He's got all of these people who are on his back who are chasing him. People trying to kill him. He's also got this constant pressure because of this calling to, to look after so many churches. Many of whom are in disarray. Many of whom are challenging him. He is exhausted. And yet his life is still marked with grace and grit. This very letter where he's in that headspace as he's writing it is marked with deep grace. As he deals with a particular situation that I want to explore briefly, we're going to look at two passages. And the first is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11. Now, as I read it, it'll feel as though we're sort of coming in on the halfway through a conversation or halfway through a story. It's because, it's because we are. This is a letter written from one person to a group of people. They all knew the context. They knew what was going on. For us, it feels like a, a bit of a leap. So just to give us a bit of a picture, the, 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 the story so far is something like this. On one of Paul's visits to Corinth, there was someone who ended up deeply at odds with Paul. They had a falling out. Things didn't go well. This person had offended Paul in some way. This person had wronged Paul in some way. This man had challenged Paul's authority. And, and the response was that Paul was deeply hurt. He found that very difficult. Now, he also knew that the church needed to deal with that because this person was doing something wrong. We don't know what this person did wrong. We, we don't know the story. That doesn't matter. They, they did. The people who wrote this, who read this message, knew what was going on. They, Paul had been wronged. The rest of the people hadn't been wronged, but Paul had been wronged. But a wrong had happened, and so Paul helped the church to see that this person needed to be helped to see what was going wrong. And so there was some kind of church discipline process where, where this person was no longer completely uh, welcome as part of that community. 
Then Paul went, and now he's writing back, and he's writing about that situation and what they need to do next. This is Paul writing about someone who had hurt him and who had wronged him in some way. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. But if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but to some extent, not to exaggerate it, to all of you. This punishment by the majority is enough for such a person. So now instead you should forgive and console him, so that he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. I wrote for this reason, to test you and to know whether you're obedient in, in, in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. And we do this so that we may not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So what is Paul's response to a man who has wronged him and to a church who mostly have turned themselves against this person and have, have sort of kept them at arm's reach? His response is, forgive him now. His response is, welcome him back, embrace him. Take him back as one of your, one of your family. It's interesting that, that he says that all people have been hurt in some way by this in verse 5. But then in verse 6, it's the punishment by the majority. Not by everyone, but by the majority. We're getting a, a picture that there's one person who's caused wrong. A lot of people have taken sort of Paul's side in this. A majority have realised this person is wrong and have rejected him. We also get a picture that there must be a minority who do not agree and who are on this person's side. So not only do we have sort of Paul versus this man... Not only do we have most of the church versus this man, we also have most of the church against a minority in the church. There's a lot of division going on here. That's why Paul says that pain has been caused for everyone. Because this wrong and this hurt and this, this division has been allowed to get to a point where there's now a community that's completely divided over this issue. That's not a good thing. It causes pain. We've just been singing about that we will be known as Christians because of our love for one another. These people wouldn't have looked particularly any different from the rest of the world because they were divided over it. Notice that Paul doesn't name the man. He doesn't point him out. He's, he's not trying to name and shame someone. If you read through all of Paul's letters, whenever he's talking about someone who is a friend, someone who he's con commending, someone who he's, uh, who, he's, who he's speaking up, he will mention their names. He will talk about them. He will elevate them. He'll say, this is a good person. Whenever he's talking about a false teacher, whenever he's talking about an opponent, whenever he's talking about someone who, who is in opposition against him, never names them. He doesn't like to speak negatively about people, to try, and, to try and pull people against someone else. He'll speak negatively about false teaching, but not about the teachers who are doing it. He'll say, don't listen to false teachers, but he won't name them. He will say, listen to Peter, because he's preaching the gospel. Paul acts with grace. He doesn't want to try and turn people away. When we are wronged, when you are wronged in your life, what is your first reaction? Is it to try and make sure everyone else knows that that person's in the wrong? Is it to talk negatively about them? Is it to take to Facebook or to, to, to write an email or write a letter trying to tell everyone else how bad this person is? Is it to talk with people at, at, at work or in the home or at the pub about how awful this person is or, or this group of people? They've attacked us, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna drag their name through the mud. Is that, is that the way that we deal with things? That's not the way that Paul models dealing with things. See, church discipline is something that is real. Church discipline is something that's important. Paul, in his previous letter, advocates some church discipline with someone, saying, saying that this person should no longer be welcome among you until they've turned their life around. Why? Because Paul wants the best for that person. Because he wants them to realise that what they're doing is not good for them and is not right, so that they can then be restored. But now he's at the point where he's saying, look, this person has been put, put away from you for long enough. Welcome them back. Forgive them. But don't just forgive them. In, in verse 7, he, he writes, now instead you should forgive and console him so that he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Paul is saying, welcome him back, but, but, but reach out to him. Go to him. All of you people who've taken my side, I want you to now to go to him, to embrace him, to welcome him, to encourage him, to console him. Why? Well, he's got this person's best interests at heart. The motivation is really clear in verse 7. So he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. This is someone who's wronged Paul. The way, you write, the, the, way, the way Paul writes, you can almost forget that this is someone who upset and hurt 
Paul. This wasn't Paul coming in as some kind of independent adjudicator between a squabble that's going on. This is someone who's hurt Paul. And he's the one who's saying, I do not want this person to be in such deep sorrow, so please, will you forgive him and will you embrace him? See, Paul, in all of those divisions, Paul, Paul has the upper hand. Paul versus this man who's offended him. Paul's the apostle. This guy's the person in the congregation. Paul's the one who has the sway. This person has very little power. The majority versus the minority. Paul has the horde with him as well. The majority versus this person. Paul could have gathered these people and said, we are the right ones. We're going to assert ourselves over everyone else. He had the power. He could have done it. Instead, he says, no. I'm calling, I'm calling a halt on this. You forgive him, please. Welcome him back. He's part of your family. Paul has all the chips. He has all the cards. He has all the bargaining he wants. And yet he chooses to extend forgiveness, to extend embrace. He gives up the right to feel hurt. He gives up the right to get his own back and make someone pay. When we're attacked, when a church in France is, in, is broken into in the middle of a service and a priest is killed, what's our response? Do we want to forgive? Do we want, when we are attacked, to extend an open hand to the person who's attacked us? Do we, do we lump everyone who, who is similar to that person in some way and, and write them all off? Or do we, do we try and reach out and build bridges with a community? What's our response? When we know we're in the right, do we cling to our rights? Would we rather win an argument? The ultimate motivation that Paul has in verse 11 is very clear. We do this. We do this forgiving. We, we, we embrace one another. So that we may not be outwitted by Satan. For we're not ignorant of his designs. Bitterness. Resentment. Hatred. Revenge. These are all weapons and methods of the enemy of this world. Not of the kingdom of Jesus Christ that we live in. Paul says elsewhere that we have been brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son who God loves. We've been brought out of this world that's, that's, that's marked by unforgiveness and resentment and hatred. When we turn back to that, when we let those things fester in our hearts, when we are wronged and we choose never to forgive, we slip back into an old way. We care too much about us winning and forget that actually it's Jesus winning that matters. And he already has. He already has the victory. And he won it by laying his own life down. By giving up his own rights. Everything that Paul is doing here is nothing compared with what Jesus has done. The Jesus who would die for his very enemies. The Jesus who would die and as he died call out for their forgiveness. The Jesus who, could have had, who had all the power and yet gave it up to serve As we look at the situations around us, as we look at a world that, at least in parts and in certain ways, is becoming increasingly hostile to the faith that we hold, what is our response? Do we batten up the hatches and say everyone else can stay out and start to enter into the political manoeuvrings and, and, and hate spreading and, and, and talking negatively about people? Or do we celebrate the good things? Do we, do we offer a hand of friendship? How willing and quick are we to forgive when we can? Paul was a man of deep grace. But I also want to talk about grit. I want to talk about determination and steeliness and perseverance. A couple of chapters later in chapter 4, Paul has had to defend his ministry because there are people who are going into Corinth and who are, who are peddling a different kind of gospel. A much more unoffensive gospel. One that doesn't talk about hardship. One that doesn't talk about difficulty. One that doesn't talk about giving or self-sacrifice. One that, one that sounds an awful lot nicer. And there are people who are going, Paul, we like this other gospel more than yours. Can we start following that? Why, why are we following you in the first place? What are, you, what are you saying? And so Paul has been defending his ministry. And, and he's talking about the fact that his own life is not that hard. That he is sort of practicing what he's preaching. And in, verse, uh, in chapter 4, the first sort of six verses, he talks clearly about how God has called him to this task. Verse 1, since it is by God's mercy that we're engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. He's saying, I don't care what anyone else says. I don't care what, I, what anyone else is doing. I know that God has called me to do this. I know that God has called me to be this. 
I'm going to keep on doing it. Of course, when we get focused on the wrong calling, when we start thinking that God has called us to this and that doesn't seem to be working, so therefore God must have given up on us, we can get confused. God has never called the, the United Kingdom to be a Christian nation. I don't think there's any such thing as a Christian nation. There's Christian people. There's Christians. There's the church. But as a nation, we're not a Christian nation. And, and, and actually, we don't necessarily, in, in, in the world's eyes, have the right to have all the things that, that we've sort of taken for granted, to be part of the establishment, to be the voice at the centre of the society rather than society, instead of a voice on the edge of society, speaking in prophetically. The church has always grown best when we've been on the outside looking in than when we've been at the centre. When the church is persecuted is the time when it tends to grow the fastest, all through history. See, Paul knew what he was called to, and he knew what he wasn't called to. And as a result, he was able to keep on going no matter what happened, because he was convinced. He knew that he was going in the right direction. He knew that he was doing the right thing. And then in verses 7 to 11, which are the verses I want to look at in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we... We see Paul speaking very honestly about the state that he finds himself in. And he's talking about the gospel, this treasure. And then he says in verse 7, We have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul understands that this kind of hardship is the life that God has called him to. He's an apostle. He's someone who's called to travel the churches at a time when Christianity is, is sort of ranging from being outlawed to being misunderstood to being maligned. And, and it's never, a, never a, an attractive job, never an easy job. He's facing a lot of trial. He's facing a lot of opposition. He's facing a lot of difficulty. And he can look at his own life and he can talk about himself as just a, a clay jar, just an earthenware pot. Nothing impressive, nothing strong, very easy to crack, very easy to break. But he talks about that almost with a, with a sense of pride that he is nothing special because then God's power can shine through. There's a stark contrast between the, the clay jar that Paul sees himself in and the extraordinary power that belongs to God. Sometimes we want to always be operating from a position of strength. We want to be the ones on the front foot. We want to be the ones who are, who are leading the way. We're not strong. By God's standards, we're very weak. We're very small. This church has a, has a reputation and a history that we can be proud of, that I am proud of being part of this church family. But we are just a clay jar. We want to build a big, impressive, useful, important building in the centre of our community to bless many people. Why? I hope it's not so that we can look and go, yeah, we've got something impressive. People look at us and go, oh, they're very good. They're very impressive. They're strong. Maybe they're God's strong too. That's just a clay jar as well. That's just a vessel. That's just something that ultimately is weak and broken and fallen and human and perishable, through which God's power can be at work. If we try to, try to say, we're impressive, so come and follow our God, people aren't going to want to come and follow us. Look at us. We're just people. We're like everyone else, except for the part of us that has God's power shining through us. It's never our power at work. When we're weak, Christ's power can shine through us. We follow a crucified Messiah. We follow someone who was willing to lay his very life down. That's weak by the world's standards. Why? So that life could burst forth. So that power could burst forth from the grave. Knowing that sometimes it's okay to be weak can give us grit and resilience and determination when we feel weak, when we feel attacked. Knowing that in some way that is part of the Christian life. Then he goes on to these verses in, in verses 8 through to 9, where he says, he talks about some things that he feels very deeply, and then he says, but I haven't got to this point, and I'm not going to get to this point. He says, we are afflicted, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, 
but not destroyed. He's saying, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's tough. This life that I'm living, this life that God has called us all to live, there will be challenges. There will be difficulties, but it will never get to this point. Yes, we may be struck down, but we will never be destroyed. The priest in France who was killed, yes, he was struck down. Yes, he was knocked down, but he has not been destroyed. He has not been crushed. He has not been defeated. He is now more gloriously alive than ever, and no one can ever harm him. As the church, that attack was an attack on all of us. We, were, we took a blow. We took a knock when that happened, but we are not crushed. We are not destroyed. We have not been forsaken. Persecuted? Yes, Paul says. Forsaken? No. God is still with us. He still has the victory. He will bring us all to that. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We have that promise that we can stand on. That no matter what happens, no matter what comes against us, we do have the victory. Yes, it, is, yes, it can be difficult, but it will never get this bad. It will ne- we will never be defeated. And that's not Paul just speaking from his experience, from his ideas, from, from, from this idea that, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a tough few months, but I really don't think it's going to get this bad. It hasn't got that bad yet, but maybe one day it will. No, this is Paul's conviction. This is Paul's theology and truth coming through, where he says, yes, hardship comes. But because of God's promises, because of Christ's victory, we will never be forsaken in a place of desperation with no hope struck down or destroyed. Those things will never happen to us. That will never be the end of our story. Why? Then he talks about death and life. He talks about carrying Christ's death around in our body, but at the same time carrying Christ's life around in our body as well. Because this, again, is Paul not just being impressive because he's Paul. This is Paul drawing on the strength that Christ gives him when he's under attack, when he's struck down, He knows that that is him modeling the same thing that Christ had. That when Jesus said that to be his follower, you must take up a cross, he knew that that meant dying to a whole way of life, dying to to a world that drove him by a whole number of things that were wrong, but also being willing to suffer, being willing to be attacked, being willing to be hurt, whether it's by the man that we looked at in chapter two or whether it's by the people in our world who are attacking the church. Sometimes it means being willing to take on that death so that life can burst forth. Jesus could not have been resurrected unless he died first. We cannot shine forth the power and the beauty and the light and the life of the resurrection of Jesus unless there is weakness and brokenness. You can't come up out of the baptismal pool unless you've gone down first. You can't have new life until the old life is gone. We're in this constant place where we know the victory will one day be complete. But even now, as we're willing to allow ourselves to be poured out for God, so God will pour into us his life and his light. We sang it because he lives. That's where our strength comes from. That's where our motivation and our grit and our resilience comes from. Not because it hasn't got so bad yet that we've failed, but because Jesus is alive. That's where it comes from. That's where things come from. And, 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 it, and it helps us. It benefits us. But it's also the only way we have a chance to speak into and to benefit our society around us. Verse 12, Paul doesn't say, so death is at work in us. But life is at work in us too. He says, but death is at work in us, but life in you. He's saying, I am willing to suffer this life that I'm leading as an apostle. Why? So that you can have life. Jesus died not so that he could have life. He had it already. Jesus died so that you and I could have life. Sometimes the way that we respond to these things, sometimes the way that, that we, when we take a blow, when we take a hit, the way that we respond to that with grace and with forgiveness and with determination to get up and to keep on going, that can bring life into the world because people will see something. People will, will see the truth of this gospel that we stand on. And other people can come to know that life as well. Paul's death in his body gave life to others, so ours can as well. 
So we take these two passages in Paul's life and we see that he was marked by intense great grace and intense determination. When he was in a position of strength against this person who'd hurt him, he gave up that strength in order to fight for the benefit of, of the one who'd wronged him, to act with grace towards him. When he's in a position of weakness and being under the cosh, he doesn't fight for himself. He works for the benefit of others. His life is always other-focused. His life is always directed towards others. This isn't a message, though, about being like Paul. Paul had many failures. Paul had many flaws. But what Paul had learnt was how to rely on the resources that Jesus had given him. How to rely on the, the resources that came through the life God had given him. Those words that I read earlier, talking about Paul's grace and his grit, say this, God's unmerited favour, his superabounding grace, reached down to Paul in all his self-righteous zeal, crushed his pride, drove him to his knees, softened his heart and transformed this once violent aggressor into a powerful spokesman for Christ. A man with that much grit needed that much grace. We need grit and grace. Grace without that determination can make us a doormat. Something that could just be walked over and, and, and mistreated and, and we just sort of bow out of the way. That's not what God calls us to be. He calls us to be firm. But he calls us to have a firmness that's marked with grace. Grit without grace. Well, then we just look like the world. Harsh and hard. We don't shine Jesus. We don't have any love. We don't have any beauty that would attract people to Jesus. I think often we can tend to one or the other. I'm sure there are people here today who really need a touch of grace for someone, for a situation, maybe for the things that are going on in the world, because you have found <laughs> hatred rising up in you, and it's a hatred that you know you mustn't let control you. Maybe for a situation that you're facing much more personally, but maybe there are others of us here who really need some determination and some steel and some resilience, that actually we need to learn to stand firm even when things are hard. Here's the truth. Sometimes our grace runs out and sometimes our grit runs out. Even the grittiest person can run out of determination one day and even the most generous person can run out of grace. God's grace and God's grit never run out. There will never be a day when he stops acting with generosity and there will never be a day when he gets worn out and loses the desire to fight for the good of this world. His goodness and determination are always constant, and that is what we need to learn to rely on. When we look at our brothers and our sisters being killed, that is what we need to turn back to. Not to look and say, what can I do about this? But God, help me. Give me the strength I need right in this moment, and God, give me the strength I need tomorrow and for the rest of the week. We're going to sing again that song we sung earlier on, that we are more than conquerors through Christ, that God has overcome this world and this life, that as a result, we don't need to bow to sin, to shame, we don't need to bow to anything. We can stand and be defiant in God. I want to leave a brief moment of pause for us to reflect on where this lands for us, for us to think about which area of our life we need strengthening in. We have a prayer ministry team and we would love to pray with you. But let's just take a moment, each of us, personally, to ask God where our character needs to be built. Where we need one of those ingredients for an overcoming life before we worship him and we declare with one another our defiance and our resilience before him.